Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you want more daily updates on audiobook. Of Mice and Men. By John Steinbeck. Chapter 5. One end of the great barn was piled high with new hay and over the pile hung the Fortalone Jackson fork suspended from its pulley. The hay came down like a mountain slope to the other end of the barn, and there was a level place as yet unfilled with the new crop. At the sides the feeding racks were visible, and between the slats the heads of horses could be seen. It was Sunday afternoon. The resting horses nibbled the remaining wisps of hay, and they stamped their feet and they bit the wood of the mangers and rattled the halter chains. The afternoon sun sliced in through the cracks of the barn walls and lay in bright lines on the hay. There was the buzz of flies in the air, the lazy afternoon humming. From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the playing peg and the shouts of men, playing, encouraging, jeering. But in the barn it was quiet and humming and lazy and warm. Only Lenny was in the barn, and Lenny sat in the hay beside a packing case under a manger in the end of the barn that had not been filled with hay. Lenny sat in the hay and looked at a little dead puppy that lay in front of him. Lenny looked at it for a long time, and then he put out his huge hand and stroked it, stroked it clear from one end to the other. And Lenny said softly to the puppy, why do you got to get killed? You ain't so little as mice. I didn't bounce you hard. He bent the pup's head up and looked in its face, and he said to it, now maybe George ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits, if he fins out you got killed. He scooped a little hollow and laid the puppy in it and covered it over with hay, out of sight, but he continued to stare at the mound he had made. He said, this ain't no bad thing like I got to go hide in the brush. Oh. No. This ain't. I'll tell George the first found, it dead. He unbared the puppy and inspected it, and he stroked it from ears to tail. He went on sorrowfully, but he'll know. George always knows. He'll say, you done it. Don't try to put nothing over on me. And he'll say, now just for that you don't get to tend no rabbits. Suddenly his anger arose. God damn you, he cried. Why do you got to get killed? You ain't so little as mice. He picked up the pup and hurled it from him. He turned his back on it. He sat bent over his knees and he whispered, now I won't get to tend the rabbits. Now he won't let me. He rocked himself back and forth in his sorrow. From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the iron stake, and then a little chorus of cries. Lenny got up and brought the puppy back and laid it on the hay and sat down. He stroked the pup again. You wasn't big enough, he said. They t told me and told me you wasn't. I didn't know you'd get killed so easy. He worked his fingers on the pup's limp ear. Maybe George won't care, he said. This here goddamn little son of a bitch wasn't nothing to George. Curly's wife came around the end of the last stall. She came very quietly, so that Lenny didn't see her. She wore her bright cotton dress and the mules with the red ostrich feathers. Her face was made up and the little sausage curls were all in place. She was quite near to him before Lenny looked up and saw her. At her. In a panic he shoveled hay over the puppy with his fingers. He looked sullenly up she said, what you got there, sonny boy. Lenny glared at her. George says I ain't to have nothing to do with you, talk to you or nothing. She laughed. George giving you orders about everything? Lenny looked down at the hay. Says I can't tend no rabbits if I talk to you or anything. She said quietly, he's scared Curly'll get mad. Well, Curly got his arm in a sling, and, if Curly gets tough, you can break his other hon. You didn't put nothing over on me about gettin', it caught in no machine. But Lenny was not to be drawn. No, sir. I ain't gonna talk to you or nothing. She knelt in the hay beside him. Listen, she said. All the guys got a horseshoe tenement going on. 
It's Ani about four o'clock. None of them guys is going to leave that tenement. Why can't I talk to you? I never get to talk to nobody. I get awful lonely. Lenny said, well, I ain't supposed to talk to you or nothing. I get lonely, she said. You can talk to people, but I can't talk to nobody but Curly. Else he gets mad. How'd you like not to talk to anybody? Lenny said, well, I ain't supposed to. George is scared I'll get in trouble. She changed the subject. What you got covered up there? Then all of Lenny's woe came back on him. Just my pup, he said sadly. Just my little pup. And he swept the hay from on top of it. Why, he's dead, she cried. He was so little, said Lenny. I was just playing with him, and he made like he's gonna bite me, and I made like I was gonna smack him, and, and I done it. And then he was dead. She consoled him. Don't you worry none. He was just a mutt. You can get another one easy. The whole country is full of mutts. It ain't that so much, Lenny explained miserably. George ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits now. Why don't he? Well, he said if I done any more bad things he ain't gonna let me tend the rabbits. She moved closer to him and she spoke soothingly. Don't you worry about talking to me. Listen to the guys yell out there. They got four dollars bet in that tenement. None of them ain't gonna leave till it's over. If George sees me talking to you he'll give me hell, Lenny said cautiously. He told me so. Her face grew angry. What's the matter with me, she cried. Ain't I got a right to talk to nobody? What do they think I am, anyways? You're a nice guy. I don't know why I can't talk to you. I ain't doing no harm to you. Well, George says you'll get us in a mess. Ah, uh, nuts, she said. What kind of harm am I doing to you? Seems like they ain't none of them cares how I gotta live. I tell you I ain't used to livin' like this. I coulda made something of myself. She said darkly, maybe I will yet. And then her words tumbled out in a passion of communication, as though she hurried before her listener could be taken away. I lived right in Salinas, she said. Come there when I was a kid. Well, a show come through, and I met one of the actors. He says I could go with that show. But my old lady wouldn't let me. She says because I was Ani 15. But the guy says I coulda. If I'd went, I wouldn't be living like this, you bet. Lenny stroked the pup back and forth. We gonna have a little place and rabbits, he explained. She went on with her story quickly, before she should be interrupted. Another time I met a guy, and he was in pictures. Went out to the Riverside Dance Palace with him. He says he was gonna put me in the movies. Says I was a natural. Soon's he got back to Hollywood he was gonna write to me about it. She looked closely at Lenny to see whether she was impressing him. I never got that letter, she said. I always thought my old lady stole it. Well, I wasn't gonna stay no place where I couldn't get nowhere or make something of myself, and, where they stole your letters, I ast her if she stole it, too, and, she says no. So I married Curly. Met him out to the Riverside Dance Palace that same night. She demanded, you listenin'? Me? Sure. Well, I ain't told this to nobody before. Maybe I oughtn't to. I don't like Curly. He ain't a nice fella. And because she had confided in him, she moved closer to Lenny and sat beside him. Coulda been in the movies, and had nice clothes, all them nice clothes like they wear. And I coulda sat in them big hotels, and had pictures took of me. When they had them previews I coulda went to them, and spoke in the radio, and 
it wouldn't ha cost me a cent because I was in the picture. And all them nice clothes like they wear. Because this guy says I was a natural. She looked up at Lenny, and she made a small grand gesture with her arm and hand to show that she could act. The fingers trailed after her leading wrist, and her little finger stuck out grandly from the rest. Lenny sighed deeply. From outside came the clang of a horseshoe on metal, and then a chorus of cheers. Somebody made a ringer, said Curly's wife. Now the light was lifting as the sun went down, and the sun streaks climbed up the wall and fell over the feeding racks and over the heads of the horses. Lenny said, Maybe if I took this pup out and throwed him away George wouldn't never know. And then I could tend the rabbits without no trouble. Curly's wife said angrily, Don't you think of nothing but rabbits? We gonna have a little place, Lenny explained patiently. We gonna have a house and a garden and a place for alfalfa, and that alfalfa is for the rabbits, and I take a sack and get it all full of alfalfa and then I take it to the rabbits. She asked, what makes you so nuts about rabbits? Lenny had to think carefully before he could come to a conclusion. He moved cautiously close to her, until he was right against her. I like to pet nice things. Once at a fair I seen some of them long hair rabbits. And, they was nice, you bet. Sometimes I've even pet mice, but not when I couldn't get nothing better. Curly's wife moved away from him a little. I think you're nuts, she said. No I ain't, Lenny explained earnestly. George says I ain't. I like to pet nice things with my fingers, soft things. She was a little bit reassured. Well, who don't, she said. Everybody likes that. I like to feel silk and velvet. Do you like to feel velvet? Lenny chuckled with pleasure. You bet, by God, he cried happily. And, I had some, too. A lady give me some, and, that lady was my own Aunt Clara. She give it right to me, bout this big a piece. I wished I had that velvet right now. A frown came over his face. I lost it, he said. I ain't seen it for a long time. Curly's wife laughed at him. You're nuts, she said. But you're a kinda nice fella. Just like a big baby. But a person can see kinda what you mean. When I'm doing my hair sometimes I just set and stroke it cause it's so soft. To show how she did it, she ran her fingers over the top of her head. Some people got kinda coarse hair, she said complacently. Take Curly. His hair is just like wire. But mine is soft and fine. Course I brush it a lot. That makes it fine. Here, feel right here. She took Lenny's hand and put it on her head. Feel right around there and see how soft it is. Lenny's big fingers fell to stroking her hair. Don't you muss it up, she said. Lenny said, oh. That's nice, and he stroked harder. Oh, that's nice. Look out, now, you'll muss it. And then she cried angrily, you stop it now, you'll mess it all up. She jerked her head sideways, and Lenny's fingers closed on her hair and hung on. Let go, she cried. You let go. Lenny was in a panic. His face was contorted. She screamed then, and Lenny's other hand closed over her mouth and nose. Please don't, he begged. Oh. Please don't do that. George'll be mad. She struggled violently under his hands. Her feet battered on the hay and she writhed to be free, and from under Lenny's hand came a muffled screaming. Lenny began to cry with fright. Oh. Please don't do none of that, he begged. George gonna say I done a bad thing. He ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits. He moved his hand a little and her hoarse cry came out. Then Lenny grew angry. 
Now don't, he said. I don't want you to yell. You gonna get me in trouble just like George says you will. Now don't you do that. And she continued to struggle, and her eyes were wild with terror. He shook her then, and he was angry with her. Don't you go yelling, he said, and he shook her, and her body flopped like a fish. And then she was still, for Lenny had broken her neck. He looked down at her, and carefully he removed his hand from over her mouth, and she lay still. I don't want to hurt you, he said, but George will be mad if you yell. When she didn't answer nor move he bent closely over her. He lifted her arm and let it drop. For a moment he seemed bewildered. And then he whispered in fright, I done a bad thing. I done another bad thing. He pawed up the hay until it partly covered her. From outside the barn came a cry of men and the double clang of shoes on metal. For the first time Lenny became conscious of the outside. He crouched down in the hay and listened. I done a real bad thing, he said. I shouldn't have did that. George will be mad. And, he said, and hide in the brush till he come. He's gonna be mad. In the brush till he come. That's what he said. Lenny went back and looked at the dead girl. The puppy lay close to her. Lenny picked it up. I'll throw him away, he said. It's bad enough like it is. He put the pup under his coat, and he crept to the barn wall and peered out between the cracks, toward the horseshoe game. And then he crept around the end of the last manger and disappeared. The sun streaks were high on the wall by now, and the light was growing soft in the barn. Curly's wife lay on her back, and she was half covered with hay. It was very quiet in the barn, and the quiet of the afternoon was on the ranch. Even the clang of the pitched shoes, even the voices of the men in the game, seemed to grow more quiet. The air in the barn was dusky in advance of the outside day. A pigeon flew in through the open hay door and circled and flew out again. Around the last stall came a shepherd bitch, lean and long, with heavy, hanging dugs. Halfway to the packing box were the puppies where she caught the dead scent of Curly's wife, and the hair arose along her spine. She whimpered and cringed to the packing box, and jumped in among the puppies. Curly's wife lay with a half covering of yellow hay. And the meanness and the plannings and the discontent and the ache for attention were all gone from her face. She was very pretty and simple, and her face was sweet and young. Now her rouged cheeks and her reddened lips made her seem alive and sleeping very lightly. The curls, tiny little sausages, were spread on the hay behind her head, and her lips were parted. As happened sometimes, a moment settled and hovered and remained for much more than a moment. And sound stopped and movement stopped for much, much more than a moment. Then gradually time awakened again and moved sluggishly on. The horses stamped on the other side of the feeding racks and the halter chains clinked. Outside, the men's voices became louder and clearer. From around the end of the last stall old Candy's voice came. Lenny, he called. Oh, Lenny. You in here? I've been figuring some more. Tell you what we can do, Lenny. Old Candy appeared around the end of the last stall. Oh, Lenny, he called again, and then he stopped, and his body stiffened. He rubbed his smooth wrist on his white stubble whiskers. I didn't know you was here, he said to Curly's wife. When she didn't answer, he stepped nearer. You oughtn't to sleep out here, he said disapprovingly, and then he was beside her and, oh, Jesus Christ. He looked about helplessly, and he rubbed his beard. And then he jumped up and went quickly out of the barn. But the barn was alive now. The horses stamped and snorted, and they chewed the straw of their bedding and they clashed the chains of their halters. In a moment Candy came back, 
and George was with him. George said, what was it you wanted to see me about? Candy pointed at Curly's wife. George stared. What's the matter with her, he asked. He stepped closer, and then he echoed Candy's words. Oh, Jesus Christ. He was down on his knees beside her. He put his hand over her heart. And finally, when he stood up, slowly and stiffly, his face was as hard and tight as wood, and his eyes were hard. Candy said, what done it? George looked coldly at him. Ain't you got any idea, he asked. And Candy was silent. I should have knew, George said hopelessly. I guess maybe way back in my head I did. Candy asked, what we gonna do now, George? What we gonna do now? George was a long time in answering. Guess, we gotta tell the, guys. I guess we gotta get, him and, lock, him up. We can't let, him get away. Why, the poor bastard would starve. And he tried to reassure himself. Maybe they'll lock, him up and, be nice to, him. But Candy said excitedly, we oughta let, him get away. You don't know that Curly. Curly Gonta wanta get, him lynched. Curly'll get, him killed. George watched Candy's lips. Yeah, he said at last, that's right, Curly will. And, the other guys will. And he looked back at Curly's wife. Now Candy spoke his greatest fear. You and me can get that little place, can't we, George? You and me can go there and live nice, can't we, George? Can't we? Before George answered, Candy dropped his head and looked down at the hay. He knew. George said softly, I think I knowed from the very first. I think I knowed we'd never do her. He USTA liked to hear about it so much I got to thinking maybe we would. Then, it's all off. Candy asked sulkily. George didn't answer his question. George said, I'll work my month and, I'll take my fifty bucks and, I'll stay all night in some lousy cat house. Or I'll sit in some pool room till everybody goes home. And, then I'll come back and, work another month and, I'll have fifty bucks more. Candy said, he's such a nice fella. I didn't think he'd do nothing like this. George still stared at Curly's wife. Lenny never done it in meanness, he said. All the time he done bad things, but he never done one of em mean. He straightened up and looked back at Candy. Now listen. We gotta tell the guys. They got to bring him in, I guess. They ain't no way out. Maybe they won't hurt, I'm. He said sharply, I ain't gonna let em hurt Lenny. Now you listen. The guys might think I was in on it. I'm gonna go in the bunkhouse. Then in a minute you come out and tell the guys about her, and I'll come along and make like I never seen her. Will you do that? So the guys won't think I was in on it? Candy said, sure, George. Sure I'll do that. Okay. Give me a couple minutes then, and you come running out and tell like you just found her. I'm going now. George turned and went quickly out of the barn. Old Candy watched him go. He looked helplessly back at Curly's wife, and gradually his sorrow and his anger grew into words. You goddamn tramp, he said viciously. You done it, didn't you? I suppose you're glad. Everybody knowed you'd mess things up. You wasn't no good. You ain't no good now, you lousy tart. He sniveled, and his voice shook. I could have hoed in the garden and washed dishes for them guys. He paused, and then went on in a sing-song. And he repeated the old words, if they was a circus or a baseball game, we would have went to her, just said, ta hell with work, and went to her. Never ast nobody say so. And, they'd have been a pig and chickens and, in the winter, the little fat stove, and, 
the rain comin', an' us jest set tin, there. His eyes blinded with tears and he turned and went weakly out of the barn, and he rubbed his bristly whiskers with his wrist stump. Outside the noise of the game stopped. There was a rise of voices in question, a drum of running feet and the men burst into the barn. Slim and Carlson and Young Wit and Curly, and Crooks keeping back out of attention range. Candy came after them, and last of all came George. George had put on his blue denim coat and buttoned it, and his black hat was pulled down low over his eyes. The men raced around the last stall. Their eyes found Curly's wife in the gloom, they stopped and stood still and looked. Then Slim went quietly over to her, and he felt her wrist. One lean finger touched her cheek, and then his hand went under her slightly twisted neck and his fingers explored her neck. When he stood up the men crowded near and the spell was broken. Curly came suddenly to life. I know who done it, he cried. That big son of a bitch done it. I know he done it. Why, everybody else was out there playing horseshoes. He worked himself into a fury. I'm gonna get him. I'm going for my shotgun. I'll kill the big son of a bitch myself. I'll shoot him in the guts. Come on, you guys. He ran furiously out of the barn. Carlson said, I'll get my Luger, and he ran out too. Slim turned quietly to George. I guess Lenny done it, all right, he said. Her next bust. Lenny coulda did that. George didn't answer, but he nodded slowly. His hat was so far down on his forehead that his eyes were covered. Slim went on, maybe like that time in weed you was tellin' about. Again George nodded. Slim sighed. Well, I guess we got to get him. Where you think he might have went? It seemed to take George some time to free his words. He would have went south, he said. We come from north so he would have went south. I guess we gotta get him, Slim repeated. George stepped close. Cooden, we maybe bring him in and they'll lock him up. He's nuts, Slim. He never done this to be mean. Slim nodded. We might, he said. If we could keep Curly in, we might. But Curly's gonna want to shoot him. Curly's still mad about his hand. And s'pose they lock him up and strap him down and put him in a cage. That ain't no good, George. I know, said George, I know. Carlson came running in. The bastard stole my Luger, he shouted. It ain't in my bag. Curly followed him, and Curly carried a shotgun in his good hand. Curly was cold now. All right, you guys, he said. The niggers got a shotgun. You take it, Carlson. When you see, um, don't give, I'm no chance. Shoot for his guts. That'll double him over. Wit said excitedly, I ain't got a gun. Curly said, you go in Soledad and get a cop. Get Al Wiltz, he's deputy sheriff. Lee's go now. He turned suspiciously on George. You're coming with us, fella. Yeah, said George. I'll come. But listen, Curly. The poor bastard's nuts. Don't shoot him. He didn't know what he was doing, dot. Don't shoot, I'm. Curly cried. He got Carlson's Luger. Course we'll shoot, I'm. George said weakly, maybe Carlson lost his gun. I seen it this morning, said Carlson. No, it's been took. Slim stood looking down at Curly's wife. He said, Curly, maybe you better stay here with your wife. Curly's face reddened. I'm going, he said. I'm gonna shoot the guts out of that big bastard myself, even if I only got one hand. I'm gonna get him. Slim turned to Candy. 
You stay here with her then, Candy. The rest of us better get going, Dot. They moved away. George stopped a moment beside Candy and they both looked down at the dead girl until Curly called, You George. You stick with us so we don't think you had nothing to do with this. George moved slowly after them, and his feet dragged heavily. And when they were gone, Candy squatted down in the hay and watched the face of Curly's wife. Poor bastard, he said softly. The sound of the men grew fainter. The barn was darkening gradually and, in their stalls, the horses shifted their feet and rattled the halter chains. Old Candy lay down in the hay and covered his eyes with his arm. Chapter 6 The deep green pool of the Salinas River was still in the late afternoon. Already the sun had left the valley to go climbing up the slopes of the Gabalin Mountains, and the hilltops were rosy in the sun. But by the pool among the mottled sycamores, a pleasant shade had fallen. A water snake glided smoothly up the pool, twisting its periscope head from side to side, and it swam the length of the pool and came to the legs of a motionless heron that stood in the shallows. A silent head and beak lanced down and plucked it out by the head, and the beak swallowed the little snake while its tail waved frantically. A far rush of wind sounded and a gust drove through the tops of the trees like a wave. The sycamore leaves turned up their silver sides, the brown, dry leaves on the ground scudded a few feet. And row on row of tiny wind waves flowed up the pool's green surface. As quickly as it had come, the wind died, and the clearing was quiet again. The heron stood in the shallows, motionless and waiting. Another little water snake swam up the pool, turning its periscope head from side to side. Suddenly Lenny appeared out of the brush, and he came as silently as a creeping bear moves. The heron pounded the air with its wings, jacked itself clear of the water and flew off downriver. The little snake slid in among the reeds at the pool's side. Lenny came quietly to the pool's edge. He knelt down and drank, barely touching his lips to the water. When a little bird skittered over the dry leaves behind him, his head jerked up and he strained toward the sound with eyes and ears until he saw the bird, and then he dropped his head and drank again. When he was finished, he sat down on the bank, with his side to the pool, so that he could watch the trail's entrance. He embraced his knees and laid his chin down on his knees. The light climbed on out of the valley, and as it went, the tops of the mountains seemed to blaze with increasing brightness. Lenny said softly, I didn't forget, you bet, god damn. Hide in the brush and wait for George. He pulled his hat down low over his eyes. George gonna give me hell, he said. George gonna wish he was alone and not have me both errand him. He turned his head and looked at the bright mountain tops. I can go right off there and find a cave, he said. And he continued sadly, and never have no ketchup but I won't care. If George don't want me. I'll go away. I'll go away. And then from out of Lenny's head there came a little fat old woman. She wore thick bullseye glasses and she wore a huge gingham apron with pockets, and she was starched and clean. She stood in front of Lenny and put her hands on her hips, and she frowned disapprovingly at him. And when she spoke, it was in Lenny's voice. I told you and told you, she said. I told you, Min, George because he's such a nice fella and good to you. But you don't never take no care. You do bad things. And Lenny answered her, I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I tried and tried. I couldn't help it. You never give a thought to George, she went on in Lenny's voice. He been doing nice things for you all the time. When he got a piece of pie you always got half or more and half. And if they was any ketchup, why he'd give it all to you. I know, said Lenny miserably. I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am. 
I tried and tried. She interrupted him. All the time he coulda had such a good time if it wasn't for you. He woulda took his pay and raised hell in a whore house, and he coulda sat in a pool room and played snooker. But he got to take care of you. Lenny moaned with grief. I know, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I'll go right off in the hills and I'll fin a cave and I'll live there so I won't be no more trouble to George. You just say that, she said sharply. You're always saying that, and you know son of a bitching well you ain't never gonna do it. You'll just stick around and stew the bee Jesus out of George all the time. Lenny said, I might just as well go away. George ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits now. Aunt Clara was gone, and from out of Lenny's head there came a gigantic rabbit. It sat on its haunches in front of him, and it waggled its ears and crinkled its nose at him. And it spoke in Lenny's voice too. Tend rabbits, it said scornfully. You crazy bastard. You ain't fit to lick the boots of no rabbit. You'd forget M and let M go hungry. That's what you'd do. And then what would George think? I would not forget, Lenny said loudly. The hell you wouldn't, said the rabbit. You ain't worth a greased jackpin to ram you into hell. Christ knows George done everything he could to jack you out of the sewer, but it don't do no good. If you think George gonna let you tend rabbits, you're even crazier than usual. He ain't. He's gonna beat hell out of you with a stick that's what he's gonna do. Now Lenny retorted belligerently, he ain't neither. George won't do nothing like that. I've knew George since, I forget when and he ain't never raised his hand to me with a stick. He's nice to me. He ain't gonna be mean. Well, he's sick of you, said the rabbit. He's gonna beat hell out of you and then go away and leave you. He won't, Lenny cried frantically. He won't do nothing like that. I know George. Me and him travels together. But the rabbit repeated softly over and over, he gonna leave you, you crazy bastard. He gonna leave you all alone. He gonna leave you, crazy bastard. Lenny put his hands over his ears. He ain't, I tell you he ain't. And he cried, oh. George, George, George. George came quietly out of the brush and the rabbit scuttled back into Lenny's brain. George said quietly, what the hell you yelling about? Lenny got up on his knees. You ain't gonna leave me, are ya, George? I know you ain't. George came stiffly near and sat down beside him. No. I knowed it, Lenny cried. You ain't that kind. George was silent. Lenny said, George. Yeah. I done another bad thing. It don't make no difference, George said, and he fell silent again. Only the topmost ridges were in the sun now. The shadow in the valley was blue and soft. From the distance came the sound of men shouting to one another. George turned his head and listened to the shouts. Lenny said, George. Yeah. Ain't you gonna give me hell? Give you hell? Sure, like you always done before. Like, if I didn't have you, I'd take my fifty bucks dash, Jesus Christ, Lenny. You can't remember nothing that happens, but you remember ever word I say. Well, ain't you gonna say it? George shook himself. He said woodenly, if I was alone I could live so easy. His voice was monotonous, had no emphasis. I could get a job and not have no mess. He stopped. Go on, said Lenny. And, when the end of the month come dash, and, when the end of the month came I could take my fifty bucks and go to a, cat house. He stopped again. Lenny looked eagerly at him. Go on, George. Ain't you gonna give me no more hell? No, said George. Well, I can go away, said Lenny. 
I'll go right off in the hills and find a cave if you don't want me. George shook himself again. No, he said. I want you to stay with me here. Lenny said craftily, tell me like you done before. Tell you what? About the other guys and about us. George said, guys like us got no family. They make a little stake and then they blow it in. They ain't got nobody in the world that gives a hoot in hell about M- dash, but not us, Lenny cried happily. Tell about us now. George was quiet for a moment. But not us, he said. Because, because I got you and dash, and I got you. We got each other, that's what, that gives a hoot in hell about us, Lenny cried in triumph. The little evening breeze blew over the clearing and the leaves rustled and the wind waves flowed up the green pool. And the shouts of men sounded again, this time much closer than before. George took off his hat. He said shakily, take off your hat, Lenny. The air feels fine. Lenny removed his hat dutifully and laid it on the ground in front of him. The shadow in the valley was bluer, and the evening came fast. On the wind the sound of crashing in the brush came to them. Lenny said, tell how it's gonna be. George had been listening to the distant sounds. For a moment he was businesslike. Look across the river, Lenny, and I'll tell you so you can almost see it. Lenny turned his head and looked off across the pool and up the darkening slopes of the gabalins. We gonna get a little place, George began. He reached in his side pocket and brought out Carlson's Luger, he snapped off the safety, and the hand and gun lay on the ground behind Lenny's back. He looked at the back of Lenny's head, at the place where the spine and skull were joined. A man's voice called from up the river and another man answered. Go on, said Lenny. George raised the gun and his hand shook, and he dropped his hand to the ground again. Go on, said Lenny. How's it gonna be? We gonna get a little place. We'll have a cow, said George. And we'll have maybe a pig and chickens, and down the flat we'll have a little piece alfalfa dash for the rabbits, Lenny shouted. For the rabbits, George repeated. And I get to tend the rabbits. And you get to tend the rabbits. Lenny giggled with happiness. And live on the fat of the lawn. Dot. Yes. Lenny turned his head. No, Lenny. Look down there across the river, like you can almost see the place. Lenny obeyed him. George looked down at the gun. There were crashing footsteps in the brush now. George turned and looked toward them. Go on, George. When we gonna do it? Gonna do it soon. Me and you. You, and me. Everybody gonna be nice to you. Ain't gonna be no more trouble. Nobody gonna hurt nobody nor steal from, M. Lenny said, I thought you was mad at me, George. No, said George. No, Lenny. I ain't mad. I never been mad, and I ain't now. That's a thing I want you to know. The voices came close now. George raised the gun and listened to the voices. Lenny begged, Lee's do it now. Lee's get that place now. Sure, right now. I gotta. We gotta. And George raised the gun and steadied it, and he brought the muzzle of it close to the back of Lenny's head. The hand shook violently, but his face set and his hand steadied. He pulled the trigger. The crash of the, sh of the shot rolled up the hills and rolled down again. Lenny jared, and then settled slowly forward to the sand, and he lay without quivering. George shivered and looked at the gun, and then he threw it from him, back up on the bank, near the pile of old ashes. The brush seemed filled with cries and with the sound of running feet. Slim's voice shouted. George. Where you at, George? 
But George sat stiffly on the bank and looked at his right hand that had thrown the gun away. The group burst into the clearing, and Curly was ahead. He saw Lenny lying on the sand. Got him, by God. He went over and looked down at Lenny, and then he looked back at George. Right in the back of the head, he said softly. Slim came directly to George and sat down beside him, sat very close to him. Never you mind, said Slim. A guy got to sometimes. But Carlson was standing over George. How'd you do it, he asked. I just done it, George said tiredly. Did he have my gun? Yeah. He had your gun. And, you got it away from him and you took it and, you killed him? Yeah. That's how. George's voice was almost a whisper. He looked steadily at his right hand that had held the gun. Slim twitched George's elbow. Come on, George. Me and, you'll go in and, get a drink. George let himself be helped to his feet. Yeah, a drink. Slim said, you had a, George. I swear you had a. Come on with me. He led George into the entrance of the trail and up toward the highway. Curly and Carlson looked after them. And Carlson said, now what the hell you suppose is eaten them two guys? The end of the book. Don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with a new book.